All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lisa Picciuti, and I am an oncology social worker here in the Carol G. Simon Cancer Center at Morristown Medical Center. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Caregiving 101, The Basics, presented by two of our oncology social workers, Maggie Brady and Kathleen Crowley. Let me introduce Maggie and Kathleen to you. Maggie Brady has been an oncology social worker at the Carol G. Simon Cancer Center at Overlook Medical Center for the past five years. She's a licensed clinical social worker, a certified oncology social worker, and has a master's degree in social work with 25 years experience. Maggie works with patients and their family members on a variety of issues that they face across the cancer disease trajectory. She provides supportive counseling to patients and caregivers, assists with practical issues which include financial concerns, insurance questions, and connection to needed community agencies. Maggie has a particular interest in helping caregivers cope with cancer when it enters their family, acknowledging their role and the importance of the help and support they provide through, throughout the disease process. Kathleen Crowley has been an oncology social worker at the Carol G. Simon Cancer Center at Morristown Medical Center for the past 11 years. She is a licensed clinical social worker, a certified oncology social worker, and has a master's degree in social work with 22 years experience in oncology. She is also certified in and teaches therapeutic touch. Kathleen is dedicated to the Radiation Oncology Department and the Women's Cancer Center and assists, with patients, and assists patients and families with coping with living with cancer and the effects of treatment. She meets with both patients and family members for supportive counseling, information on disability, financial and community resources. Kathleen's interests include caregiving and survivorship. Today's presentation will be in listen-only mode, but you can ask questions via the question, tool, question box on the webinar toolbar at any time. We'll gather the questions throughout the program and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. We'll begin this presentation with Maggie. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. We are very happy to be here today sharing our knowledge and insight on the subject of family caregivers. Over the next hour, you will learn some tips and techniques to cope with your role as family caregiver. But first, we would like to acknowledge the important, the important role that family caregivers play in taking care of a person who's diagnosed with cancer. The caregivers are the glue that hold the family system together. Caregivers have a lot of responsibility. Often caregivers are juggling the needs of a variety of people. When we give out educational material or folders or binders to patients when they begin their cancer experience, I can't tell you how many times the folder is handed right over to the caregiver and the patient says something like, he's my memory, or she's the keeper of the information, or I can't absorb anything more. So the caregiver becomes the keeper of many pieces of this puzzle. You'll also hear today how family caregivers feel ill-prepared for this role, and they often feel very overwhelmed. But there is good news, and the news is that we have developed support systems and programs for caregivers. At the Carol G. Simon Cancer Center at Overlook Medical Center, we have dedicated volunteers to help caregivers. We have a caregiver center that's located in the hospital, and its sole purpose is to support caregivers. We offer caregivers the opportunity to restore and recharge by making massage, yoga, and support groups available to them while the patient or loved one is hospitalized. At Morristown Memorial, we have dedicated volunteers who help the caregivers and provide them with information and support. They provide quarterly luncheon for caregivers, and, and we've identified that there is a need to support the caregivers and that there is a need to recognize that the caregivers have a very, very important job. In fact, the month of November is Caregivers Month because we recognize that your role is so very important. Um, years ago, Rosalind Carter um, was quoted as saying that um, there are four kinds of people in the world. 
those who currently are caregivers, those who have been caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. Seeing this slide really brings to mind that caregivers must learn how to cope uh, with this role. We know that cancer is a family disease. When a person hears the diagnosis of cancer, they feel that their life has just changed and there's an impact on everyone who loves and cares for them. But cancer doesn't mean that the family or the patient should stop living. Patients and caregivers will learn to adjust, to accept, to cope, and to function with the changes that the diagnosis of cancer brings. There are tools to help them cope. There are lots of resources available. There are multiple books. There's websites. There's articles on how to become a caregiver. Caregiving has become commonplace. The improvement in cancer treatment has resulted in more cancer survivors, and it has produced more family caregivers. I think this says a mouthful. Uh, so what we're seeing are more cancer survivors, and that's good news. We're seeing that more people are living longer with a diagnosis of cancer, and we like all of those statistics. More survivors translates into more caregivers. So we need to talk about the different roles that caregivers play, and we need to help them cope with these different roles. A patient may actually need more than one caregiver. We're going to suggest that you expand your perspective on who family caregivers are and how you all can help get the support that you need. This slide reminds me that caregivers need to make a mental shift from being in a crisis mode of the initial diagnosis and learning to live, uh, then learning to live with the chronic aspects of the disease. To recognize that there is an ebb and a flow for patients as well as for the caregiver. So in other words, because we have more survivors of this disease, caregivers need to learn to make frequent adjustments to the roles that they play within the family system. To me, this drives home the point that caregivers have to also learn ways to take care of themselves. All of the literature on caregiving in, uh, uh, looks to the importance of self-care. Kathleen is going to provide some valuable tips and information on self-care a little bit later in the presentation. But we are going to shift to Kathleen right now. We're going to hear from Kathleen Crowley, who um, is an oncology social worker who is with me on this webinar. And she has a very unique perspective. And I'd like to call it the view from both sides of the bed. Uh, she has the perspective of being a patient. Um, she has the perspective of being a caregiver. And she is an oncology social worker. Kathleen was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of 23, and she was treated at a large cancer center, and she shared with me the perspective of being a patient um, and those emotions around the idea that her entire family had rallied around her and were worried about her, making frequent trips to the hospital and living with a tremendous amount of, of uncertainty. So Kathleen is, is kind enough to share that personal perspective with us. Um, so let's let's see what her um, feelings were when she was a patient those many years ago. Thank you, Maggie. Fortunately, it was many years ago that just one year out of college, I was diagnosed and floored by the diagnosis of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This information just reverberated through my entire family with shock and fear and, oh my goodness, how did this happen? And it impacted, it was very clear the impact on the entire family, my parents, all my siblings, and even went into cousins. Uh, so as the treatment started, I was lucky enough to have a great deal of support. Um, people would come into the city and also donate blood as needed. As time went on and it was clear that I needed a bone marrow transplant, my sister was a perfect match. Um, 
even though it was very successful, it was a very arduous uh, treatment process, including, daily, you know, my family would make daily trips into New York City. And even though what I went through was very difficult, I was very clear of the impact on my family and how draining it could be and just living in the uncertainty. And as much as they could do for me, it was clear there was a sense of helplessness, especially for my parents. Um, it was clear that they, you know, they couldn't change it or make it go away. So as time went on, I could see the draining process. And as I have shared with many patients, I always felt that it was harder for the caregiver than the patient. Um, Many people will disagree with me, but many patients will agree. Then I had the unique perspective of many years later, uh, my father was diagnosed with renal cell cancer. The unique um, difficulty and challenge was that he had lost a kidney years prior to a disease. So the one remaining kidney was now cancerous, and they're going to try to save it. So he was in a very long surgery, and I was with my siblings and my mother in the surgical waiting area. My, in the very same hospital that I was cared for. It was my family starting to reminisce about what it was like a couple decades prior of when they came to see me. And I was very clear at that point because it was just so challenging to wait the many hours to find out what my father's fate would be. Would he have to have dialysis? Would he survive the surgery? What would his quality of life be? So as I was very aware of those emotions, I was also aware that what I had said earlier, that I thought it was easier to be a patient. It was easier to be up on the floor in a bed being cared for by all the nurses, by the doctors, um, rather than to be in that waiting room feeling so uncomfortable, fearful, and out of control. And now as a, a social worker, I have a third perspective um, because I see patients, and I see family members, and I see the family members and the impact on them and how hard it is. And sometimes the resistance for them to feel that they're entitled, the resistance for them to accept the support and to feel entitled, which we will both be um, discussing later on in the program. I am going to pass, um, I'm going to go back to Maggie, and then I will be speaking again later on in the program. Thanks, Kathleen, for sharing uh, that story with us and your personal perspective um, from both sides of the bed. Uh, it sounds like you, you have a large family, and it sounds like they've all been involved in, um, in the roles, when it was, whether it was caring for you or later in life caring um, for your father. Um, and so we as oncology social workers see that there are many different kinds of caregivers. In, in your uh, story that you shared, uh, your mom was, was likely the primary caregiver, uh, probably for you and for your dad. Um, but then as, as time goes on, there's the primary caregiver and then there are all the other people that are involved in the caregiving experience. Uh, so, so who are those people? And, and there, can, there can be many. Um, they can be the spouse, children, friends, partners, co-workers, church members, neighbors, stepchildren, grandchildren. It's really anyone that the patient turns to and relies on for help. Um, caregivers can also live at, at, a long, at a distance. They don't always have to be in the same town or around the corner. Um, and they, they often need a more than one caregiver. And so for just a second, I'd like to talk about the long distance caregiver because they have a really, really important and helpful role. And they're often feel, they often feel left out of the system because they, they're, they're not around the corner. Um, but they can 
provide a tremendous amount of help by visiting for longer periods of time. And they can get a lot of things accomplished in, in that period of time. They can allow the family uh, caregivers, the other family caregivers, to get a break. Um, the long distance caregiver can help with research. They can gather information. They can manage the communication with other family members and friends. There are several free services available to patients and family members where uh, you can uh, obtain uh, a password uh, protected um, website and you can communicate with the people that you designate uh, and the long distance caregiver can be in charge of that website and can take a burden off the primary caregiver by managing all those communication. Um, they manage the emails and the phone calls. Uh, so it really does make a difference. One of the uh, these websites is called Caring Bridges uh, and that information is at the end of the, of, uh, the presentation. Um, so communication. Communication is really, really important. Uh, communication with the patient, communication with family, communication with your medical team, um, and the communication for the needs of the caregiver. And that probably is one of the more challenging things. Caregivers don't feel that they need to communicate their needs. But Kathleen is going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, it's really important to be open and honest with the patient, with each other. Keep those lines of communication open. Um, avoid the inclination of wanting to protect people in the family. Uh, people want to be engaged. They want to have jobs. They want to be able to help. Uh, and they want to be included in the, proce in the process. Um, so let them do that and continue to communicate with them. Use technology. Use Skype. Use email. FaceTime. And use ways to facilitate communication. Your medical team. Ask questions. They want to be there for you too and they're open to using other means of communication. Uh, texting, email, calling, uh, calling them on, on, uh, in the office and, and having those dialogues. And it's really important to, to do that and to keep those, uh, those communication lines open. Everybody has the same goal and that is to uh, have the patient have the best experience that they can have. Um, so what are the tasks that the family caregiver is responsible for? There are many, um, and I'm just going to name a few because they're kind of the highlights. Uh, personal care, transportation, assisting with daily activities, uh, preparing, uh, participating in um, the medical uh, needs at home, managing the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation, providing emotional support and companionship, Planning for the future, perhaps the person needs an assisted living or a nursing home where they need to explore hospice. Learning about the financial aspect of, of, of care, advanced directives and healthcare proxy. These are all the things that the caregiver uh, feels that they have a responsibility for and it can be really overwhelming. Um, I just want to take a minute and talk about advanced directives. I think that advanced directives and healthcare proxies are really important because they uh, begin a conversation. Um, the one thing you also need to know is that you don't need a lawyer to have these documents completed. The forms can be found on uh, websites like Five Wishes or they can be found at your local hospital. Uh, I know we have them here at, um, at, at Overlook and, and at Morristown and all the hospitals have to be able to provide you with uh, those forms to be completed as needed. So the, 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 the forms encourage you to have dialogue with your family. Um, they encourage you to talk about what can be some uncomfortable uh, topics, but I believe that these conversations are really helpful um, on multiple levels. They encourage the patient to identify what they want and what they don't want and then to communicate that to their healthcare decision maker. Um, I believe that acknowledging that they, there may be a time where they're not going to be able to speak for themselves or not going to be able to make those decisions that, um, that they recognize that they need to still participate um, in, in, in their decision making. Um, they, what 
patients have and family members have actually told me is that by having the advanced directive and having had these conversations, they really do reduce the amount of guilt that the caregiver may feel when they do have to make very difficult decisions at the end of life if the patient is not able to make them for themselves. So um, they really are a wonderful uh, way to, again, communicate. I probably said that a lot, but I, I really believe that that's, um, that that's the, the heart of it all. Uh, there's a wonderful tool that um, is available, again, on the website. Um, it's called the Conversation Project, and uh, that information is at the end of this presentation, and it's a great guide um, through these very difficult conversations. And then, of course, once you have the conversations, you need to document them, and you need to make sure that uh, you have copies provided to your healthcare uh, professionals as well as to the folks that are, are on your um, health care and your directives. So as you can hear, uh, caring for a family member is complex and there are some challenges uh, and, and they include coordination of care, there are physical burdens that a family member who's the caregiver may feel. Um, they may throw their back out in the middle of taking care of someone. Uh, so there are definitely are things that are unexpected that comes up. Um, there's the emotional response to, uh, to cancer by the patient and the, and the caregiver. There's an in, uh, financial impact to uh, being a caregiver and, and, and helping a person who's diagnosed with cancer. Um, one thing that Kathleen and I hear from caregivers a lot is the fact that they don't feel that they're very competent to do this job. They don't feel like they have enough information or they're very good at it. So um, we hear that a lot about that, that feeling of, of being um, not prepared for this kind of responsibility. And then of course caregiving like a diagnosis of cancer uh, is a roller coaster. Um, so there are a lot of adjustments that you need to make along this road. Uh, as a caregiver, there is uh, an ebb and a flow to it. Um, there, the financial impact for caregiving can be a major challenge. There's insurance issues, there are disability questions, there are uh, unemployment um, issues, there's expenses. Very often people will say that this, this cancer diagnosis had come at a terrible time. Uh, I'm, I'm sending children to college, I'm planning for a wedding, um, I, I'm trying to retire. Um, so these are all uh, complex things that, that, uh, that occur in a family when, when cancer has been diagnosed. Uh, so one of my roles as the oncology social worker is to help guide the caregiver by giving them good, reliable, and accurate information um, and often discussing how to dis dissect these issues and address several questions um, and, and prioritizing them and, and helping them understand um, that, that there are ways to get through this and that they can cope um, with all of these complexities. So this is a slide from the American Cancer Society and it reports that nationwide there are 13 million cancer survivors. Uh, that's a lot of people living with cancer. Uh, across the United States, three out of four families will have at least one family member with a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, and and that's, you know, that, that's, that is good news and that is a lot of, of survivors, um, but it also means that we need a lot of caregivers to, uh, to help people through this, through this illness. So how do caregivers cope with their ever-changing roles? Uh, and just to summarize what we've talked about so far is we've discussed statistics, we've discussed the complex roles, uh, we've discussed the, uh, the roller coaster uh, that caregivers are on, uh, some of the tasks that have to be managed, and how critical you are to the patient and that you are in fact the glue that holds everything together. Uh, and we really do thank you for that. We thank all those caregivers out there. Um, but it's really important that you learn to cope all along uh, this journey. And, and there are some very specific things that you can do. Uh, and, uh, and Kathleen is going to talk about those specific things. And it's really important that you take the time uh, to, to take care of yourselves. And I'm going to just I'll let Kathleen continue on um, and talk about coping. Thank you, Maggie. 
I think it's important before I start to talk about specific techniques, I want to look at the um, common reactions of the caregiver. Because many people who have come to our um, presentation and luncheon, they feel isolated and they start to feel like they're the only ones who have experienced these um, sometimes uncomfortable emotions and reactions. First of all, it can be extremely overwhelming to be a caregiver. In most situations, you're thrown into this unprepared, not expecting that your loved one will have cancer. Nobody expects to have cancer. And all of a sudden, you're dealing with a world of um, treatment and hospitals and doctor's appointments, talking to doctors, hearing long names of chemotherapy, which, you know, you can't even understand how they're spelled. And it's just um, overwhelming, to say the least. Um, and this, of course, can bring some anxiety, because uh, the anxiety of, okay, can I do this? Am I doing this right? Um, taking on so much, because the caregiver is also often taking on additional household household tasks. Maybe it's a husband who's diagnosed and now, and he used to always do the bills, now the wife is doing that. And she's the primary um, breadwinner. And she's the one dealing with the emotions. And she's trying to keep the children's lives normal. That's an awful lot to do. So, and also the um, whole family's living with uncertainty. As the cancer came very unexpectedly, you really aren't always sure of what the outcome will be. Even if you're going through the treatment and you've had surgery and you're doing everything that you're supposed to do, you still aren't um, exactly sure what the outcome will be. Of course, this is bringing anxiety, which could bring sleepless nights, um, some other anxious um, experiences some people have had. Um, panic attacks need to really um, have some counseling, which is understandable because it's really a lot to be thrown into all at once. Um, sometimes depression happens. You know, you're suddenly dealing with the situation that you don't feel like you have any control over. You're concerned about what the outcome will be. What if I'm a single mother? You know, all these thoughts go through one's head um, as much as you try not to. Um, so that fear, um, anxiety, that could lead to depression. And this is why it's so important to stay connected with your healthcare care um, staff, your social worker, so that they can support you, so that maybe to head off some of these really difficult situations. Um, I've mentioned that helplessness and lack of control. And also what happens is because people become tapped out, sometimes they get very frustrated. I remember once uh, driving with my mother and we were, yeah, I would go down um, to see her and try to take her out like on a Saturday, even if it was just errands or go to the mall, just to get her away from the situation. And at one point we were, um, out and my father called and he wanted something from the store and she got so frustrated she's like I was just there this morning and then she felt so bad that she barked at him because that was not their typical um, that was not their typical relationship however she was just really tapped out but unfortunately what happens after somebody gets frustrated and maybe she's, um, becomes angry they feel guilty. You know, I'm not the one going through treatment. I should be more patient. I should be kinder. I should be, I should, I should, I should. But it's really difficult to do all these when you're juggling so many balls at once. And of course, all of this can lead to exhaustion because you're just trying to keep a whole world stable that has suddenly gone awry. Okay. I can't tell you how many times I have um, met with a patient and turned to the caregiver, the spouse or family member, and said, so how are you doing? And they're like, but I'm not the patient. 
I'm not having, yeah, I'm not the one having the treatment. But yes, you're not. However, your role is, can be very difficult for all the reasons Maggie and I have stated. But I find that sometimes there's challenges um, for people to accept support from either the social workers or family members or their community. They're so used to not doing things. They really have a very, very difficult time asking for help. That's really common. Um, the other thing that's really common is my children are too busy. I don't want to burden them. Um, anybody who lives in the tri-state area knows how busy life is. And when you have kids and, you know, you're, you know, the grandkids are being taken care of and brought to all the different sporting events and, and um, the patient and caregiver don't want to bother their family system. Um, the other thing is, I don't, you know, that I hear a lot, I don't have time to take care of myself. And you know what, you probably don't. However, it's essential that you do. You have to make time. Nobody's going to show up at the door and say, here, I have some time for you. Go ahead. Go out. You have to somehow put it in your life. It's not always easy. The other thing that I just wanted to mention is um, when I hear I'm not the patient. Um, it's so important that the caregiver realizes how important they are. Uh, my other colleagues and I often use the analogy of um, when you're flying on a plane, the airline attendants will give a little demonstration in the beginning that if the air cabin lost pressure, then the um, oxygen mass will come from the ceiling. If you are traveling with either a child or an elderly person, they tell you to put the mask on yourself first. Well, for most of us who have ever taken care of somebody who's ill, that is so counterintuitive because you want to just take care of that person. However, think about it. If you are flying and all of a sudden there's not enough oxygen in the cabin and you put it on somebody else but not yourself, you could faint. And if you're unconscious, who's going to take care of your caregiver? So it is vitally important to take, you know, to take care of yourself and accept help. So here's some tips to coping with the role of, this, um, of the uh, caregiver. Talk to the oncology social worker in the center where um, your loved one is being treated. Um, there are so many, you know, um, <clears throat> benefits to this. As Maggie had mentioned, some of the things that sh she knows of in the community and financial programs and different things that she can help the family with. The other thing that I think is vitally important is whether we realize it or not, we protect our family members. So sometimes we don't want to tell them how difficult it is for us. Either we don't feel entitled, entitled to those feelings or we don't want to burden them. So if you have the ability to talk to an oncology social worker, you could talk to what it's really like to go through this, what it's really like to have the fears, what it's really like to be exhausted, what it's, tr what it's like to try juggling everything. The other thing is that the oncology social worker in most centers will be able to, you know, we have programs to teach you some quick stress busters. And what we mean by a stress buster is just, you know, when you're really stressed, just try to take, take a really deep breath down to your belly. And you're going to notice how your shoulders relax. You're going to notice how all of a sudden you become slightly more relaxed than when you, when, before you started breathing or noticing your deep breathing. Um, meditation and prayer, these are all things that can help uh, step away from your daily stress, even if it's only a few minutes. I'm going to get into more detail about how, how and why that works and what you can do later on in the program. Take time to recharge yourself. This is so important. Most people say, well, I can't. I can't leave him. I can't leave her. 
Um, well, maybe you have a family member or neighbor who's willing to come over and to say, you know, I'll sit with Charlie. You know, why don't you go out and get your hair done? Or I had a patient's wife who told me that she loved to um, dance. And she went to a folk dancing group. And she said, I never stopped. I did that once a week. And that's what gave me the energy to keep going. So whatever it is that's important to you, make sure you do it because this will actually give you more energy. Keep a journal. This is a way to uh, release some of your um, emotions, some of the uh, struggles, some of the frustrations you're dealing with. Explore your spiritual side. I know at the Carol G. Simon Cancer Center we have uh, spiritual counseling. Um, but there are other ways. Spirituality is a very individual um, but very beneficial support. Um, so this is something that many people can find to be very helpful. Join a support group or group. And some people even find that when they're waiting for their family members, they um, connect with other people who, whose husband or wife might be dealing with something similar. And just having that connection to somebody who's going through something similar to you is really helpful. It's real important to learn to say no. No, I can't volunteer anymore because my life's too busy because of the additional role additional tasks you have to have you have and learn to say yes and this is particularly difficult for people who are used to taking care of everything and everyone in the house learn to say yes when somebody says can I you know drive your loved one to the um, radiation treatment or can I do can I cut your lawn for you can I help you with the laundry or cleaning or cooking you know, learn to say yes. As was identified earlier in the program, we're all going to be on the side of the caregiver at some point. Um, so it's helpful to, you know, life is give and take. So it's important to know when it's time to say yes, I need a little help, and to accept it. Doesn't mean that you're not strong. Doesn't mean that at all. Exercise whether it's walking, riding a bike, swimming, uh, yoga, restructuring, whatever it is, um, this will release some of the stress. It'll give you a little presence of mind to think of something else. Um, and it can be an activity that you actually enjoy. And share your feelings with friends and families. Tell them what it's like to go through. And when the emotions that are really difficult. I mentioned, have, you know, guilt when it's so difficult and then feeling that you should be stronger, or you should be better at this or whatever, and then you feel guilty. Don't. Nobody told you you would have to do this. Nobody gave you any training. Um, you, anybody in the situation of a caregiver is doing the very best they can. You know, some people are okay with crying. Other people don't feel comfortable doing it. But you know, we have tear, tear ducts for, for a reason. Sometimes you just need to cry. Most people will say, yeah, I feel a lot better. I have a colleague who often, when she feels like she has had so much and she just needs relief, she will go see a sad movie so that this will get her to cry purposely. Have a good laugh. Did you ever have a really good belly laugh that you feel so good after? Don't feel guilty. This is a great thing to do. Get a funny movie. Find somebody that you know can make you laugh. Do something that you know will make you happy, silly, whatever. Um, play with a the child. They're so present and they might make you laugh just being a child. It's also important to know who is in your support team. Like, who is the doers? Who are the ones who are actually going to come over and just start doing for you? Start cleaning the house, 
do the laundry, who are actually who are going to organize or, or actually bring a meal. Who are the ones who are going to be concrete? Who are the listeners? Who are the ones who are easy to be with, who are not going to tell you how to solve a problem, but just to listen? You know, many of us have heard, oh, it's going to be fine. I know it. Well, you know what? Nobody knows it. And sometimes, even though the intention is good, often that kind of gives the message unspoken. It's like, I really don't want to hear you talk about your, um, your emotions and your fears. Many people don't realize that's the message giving. But often you just want to talk. You don't want a solution. Okay, who's the organizers? Who's the one who could get the word out? You know, I had a recent patient who said, you know, I've been through this before, I'm going through it again, and I just don't want to talk to everybody. It's just too tiring. So they came up with a plan of who in the circle of friends will be the communicator. She will be the one that they give the information to, and she will get the information out to the circle of friends. Who's the one who organizes all the meals for the family so that you don't get 10 baked CDs in, in one week, but actually organizes the meals so you get something that the family could enjoy? And attitude. Who's the one that you could um, cry with that you feel most comfortable to cry with? And who do you know who you can laugh with? I have a friend from childhood that no matter what in life is going on, I know we can laugh about it. And the darker it is, the more we laugh. And that's, that's so important for both of us. Okay, knowledge is power. It's really important to know what community programs are available. Here at the Carol G. Simon Cancer Center at Morristown, we do have uh, resource navigators, and they will meet with families and caregivers and tell them what, the what programs we have here and what, are, um, what is in the community. And also, in both facilities, we have a lot of, resource, a lot of support resources. And we have calendars, we have booklets, we have flyers. So it's really important to know what's going on because the, you know, the yoga program or the meditation program is open to the uh, family member also. So it's important to know the schedule. When are these um, programs available? When my uh, loved one is having chemo for eight hours, what is available that I could do to take care of myself? Learn about the Family Medical Leave Act. It's also, we use the um, initials FMLA. This is a law, and you could get more information from the, the United States Department of Labor or um, Career and Cancers, and Career and Cancers is on our resources. But this is basically the ability for somebody to take 12 work weeks of leave to care for an ill family member. It has to be over a 12-month period. Now, there are also um, guidelines that, you know, for the employer, they have to have, like, 50 employer employees, so there are certain requirements that you would have to look into, so it would be really important to uh, connect with your human resources in the company that you work with. But the employer's responsibility is to give the firm former position back to the person who goes on family leave and to provide insurance during this time, which is very important for many, many people. The other thing is some companies will actually give intermittent, like maybe you could uh, take family medical leave that you could take four days a week, or you could take a couple days a week and then come back, and, and um, or a couple hours just to care for the person who's having treatment. 
So that's important to know. Again, connect with the um, human resources in your company. Then search reputable websites. Many doctors are so, say, don't get on the internet because they don't want people to be overwhelmed or scared or get onto a website that's not reputable. So we have, um, as a resource, we have all the programs that are reputable, American Cancer Society, uh, National Cancer Institute, Cancer Care, and you'll see on the resources that there's also cancer and careers because it's important to also know not just for yourself but for the patient um, who may have to take time off from work um, all the different programs that protect that person like cancer and the American with Americans with Disability Act that's real important to know because um, it protects um, cancer survivors from discrimination cancer you know um, and it requires employers to make reasonable accommodations for people coming back to work after having a medical leave. Um, Maggie had mentioned certain documents um, that are important to have. Many are, um, you know, you don't need an attorney, but some you do. You know, uh, a last will and testament is important. So it's it's also important to know when you need an attorney. And even though we haven't mentioned this much, there are sometimes that the, um, unfortunately the person does not survive cancer. So there are end of life documents that are very important. And I'm going to just go back to the conversation project, which is the national project that you could Google, Google and actually see it. And this is a way for families to have a conversation before it's needed. We did it in my family, and at first my husband was very nervous about it. But I have to tell you, once he got over it, and, um, everyone was very comfortable with it and gave everyone the opportunity to know, if, you know when his time is, is ready um, or near, then there are certain things that he wants and does not want. And other people in the conversation start saying what they would want or not. So it's really important to just get it out there because if there was a crisis, if somebody relapsed and somebody was not able to um, make their own decisions or all of a sudden the emotions are so high, it's really hard to deal with some of these things in a crisis. Okay, restore and relax. Um, some of you listening to this webinar said, yeah, right, might think, oh, sure, right. I don't have any time for myself, and I don't have time to relax. But I want to tell you a little bit more about this. Um, I want to mention um, a Dr. Herbert Benson that several decades ago, he is, um, he is a professor at the um, Harvard Medical School. And years and years ago, he was doing experiments on the mind and body connection. And he had a group of um, students who were practicing transcendental meditation who said, you know, work with us. And what he realized is that um, he recognized the calming effect of this and he could see that the body showed striking changes and the breathing, the heart rate slowed, the oxygen consumption dropped, brain waves took on different patterns, and clearly there is a connection between the mind and the body. Now, most of us who have ever had any kind of stress, which is all of us, um, we often will go into what's considered the flight or fight response. That is um, a term that kind of goes back to caveman, that if a big dinosaur is coming ready to make you dinner, you're going to either try to fight it or run away from it. And this is the body's reaction to stress. Well, we can counteract it by doing some of these um, stress techniques. Dr. Benson, um, in 1988, founded the mind-body 
Medical Institute, and he basically coined the term relaxation response. This basically, this term is basically when a person is ready to, or, or is able to accomplish all these things I mentioned, that the heart rate slows, um, the oxygen slows, and they are in between this, um, they're not in a sleep state, but they're not in a wake state, and the body relaxes on a very, very deep level. He put together this technique that's really quite simple. Um, it's just suggested that you sit in a comfortable place, you pick a word or a short phrase, something like um, peace, be still, and any time you your mind wanders, you just come back to this. So you're not worrying about your loved one. You're not over um, extended. You're just in this state of thinking about this word. Or you could just breathe very slowly and deeply and really concentrate on your breathing. Now, you could do this for 10 or 20 minutes and realize that your whole body feels different, or you could do it for two minutes. You could be in the bathroom, and you're at the doctor's appointment, your chemo appointment, and you have a few minutes, you could go into the bathroom and just take some deep breaths. You could be mindful, and mindfulness means whatever you're doing, you're focusing just on that task, whether it is just drinking a cup of tea. So you can feel the warmth in your hands on the cup, the warmth in your mouth and throat, and the taste. Instead of worrying about, when are we going to get out of here? Is he going to be sick? Is she going to have a rough night? You're just mindful in that task. Now, we have a lot of programs at both centers that have these components with it, whether it's learn to meditate or yoga, um, drumming. And these are techniques that really just help the person find ways to quiet your mind. We, you know, many of us have a lot of monkey chatter. And that's a term to it's very busy mind. But when you have a situation dealing with a family member who's ill, you know, there's a lot of fertile ground to worry. So the idea is to train yourself, um, you know, use a program, um, work with one of the social workers to really find a way to take a mental vacation, whether it's for two minutes or 20 minutes. Okay, and this slide is identifying all the resources and websites that we have available and that we are suggesting these are the ones, <coughs> excuse me, that would be helpful. The other thing that I want to mention is the Caregiver's Bill of Rights. Now, the Caregiver's Bill of Rights is really focusing, really focusing on what it is like for the person, or what rights the caregiver has. Now this came, it says author unknown, but you could also find it under AARP. But if you, I'm not going to read through the whole thing because it is a slide, but it does say I have the right to take care of myself, I have the right to seek help from others, um, maintain facets of my own life. These first three uh, statements are all statements we identified as coping resources that can help one get through the difficulty or the challenges or just to give you more energy. Now I just want to go to the last stage and I want, I want to invite everyone to take the time to read this through and you know maybe download it and put it on your refrigerator just to remind yourself to take care of yourself. And um, this last slide were all caregivers. You see a whole group of people, and you see people um, congregating, and they're having a picnic. And you can't pick out which one, except the one holding a baby, which one is actually taking care of another. But in this 
group of people, you know that there will be some who are caregivers, there are some who are receiving care. So in conclusion, I hope that some of the tips and techniques um, and ideas that we brought forth were helpful. And um, please be mindful of all the resources that we have here at the Carol G. Cancer Center, both at Morristown and Summit Medical Center. Overlook Medical Center in Summit. Thank you, and, and I'm just going to give it to Lisa for questions. Thank you, Maggie and Kathleen. That was really informative and had a lot of great ideas for caregivers to use. We had two questions that came through, and the first one is, you have, mentioned us, you have mentioned support groups, and there is one at my local church. I would like to join one, but I'm afraid that hearing all of those problems will make me feel sad. What can I expect from a support group? Who would like to take this? All right, Maggie? Yeah, hi. We get that response a lot when it comes to support groups. Uh, people feel like they're just going to be more depressed, quote unquote, after attending a support group. But in reality, I think we find that the opposite is true. I think you find that there are more people that are like you and that are struggling with the same kinds of concerns and worries and that, that reaching out and, and meeting with people that have the same concerns uh, is actually uh, can be very therapeutic. So I would advise you to take that step to go out to the support group and, and to meet some other caregivers and, and hopefully you'll have a positive experience. Thank you. Okay, our next question is, my husband does not want anyone except me to help him and I am so tired of doing everything. How can I get him to accept help from others? And Kathleen will start this one. Thanks, Lisa. Um, unfortunately, this is a common situation. Um, the, the patient might be just so comfortable and so um, used to the one person taking care of them and not realizing the strain. So there's a couple things that one can do. First of all, I would connect with your own support system, whether that's friends, family, definitely the social worker. And also to try to have a conversation of how it really is very difficult for one person to do it all. Uh, we all know the, um, the statement, it takes a village. And maybe he's not comfortable or she's not comfortable with anyone else doing the um, personal care, and that's understandable, but how about other things and other duties? Okay, so like asking a friend, a neighbor, or a family member to take the person. And it's um, it might be repeated conversations and maybe the help of a healthcare professional to really identify the need for more than one person to be in this role. You do not want to burn out the person and then you won't have really any care at all. And it goes back to the um, analogy of the, um, the analogy of flying and the oxygen mask. Thank you, Kathleen. All right, that's the end of our uh, webinar for today. Thank you so much for joining us. This will be posted on the Atlantic Health website, um, and I hope uh, that you find it there and find our other webinars there. Thanks so much.